Hello and welcome to Five Artists, Five Questions, Reframing Portraiture. This series is presented in conjunction with Black American Portraits, an exhibition that reframes portraiture to center Black American subjects, sitters, and spaces. This series includes conversations between artists and LACMA curators and educators. This is the fourth in the series, and each artist has been presented with the same five key questions about portraiture, exploring how this art form historically has functioned, as well as providing us with new perspectives on representation. My name is Liz Andrews. I am the co-curator of Black American Portraits and the executive director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. Please welcome with me our artist for today, Leslie Saar. Leslie Hi. Saar. Oh, hey. <laughs> I'll read your bio and we'll get started here. Mm -hmm. So Leslie Saar is a mixed media artist currently living in Los Angeles. While majoring in communications at San Francisco State University, she worked at KPFA Radio in Berkeley as a part of a collective the souls of black folk. There she shared, started illustrating for her writer friends. And in the 1980s, she began making altered books. Her works now include paintings, drawings, altered books, banners, collages, dioramas, and installations. Some of her various recent series include anomalies, Mulatto Nation, Tooth Hut, Gender Renaissance, A Conjuring of Conjurers, and Black Garden. All of her work deals with notions of race, gender, beauty, normalcy, escapism, and sanity. She has exhibited nationally and internationally and is in museum collections such as LACMA here in Los Angeles, the Studio Museum in Harlem, MOCA in Los Angeles, CAM in Los Angeles, the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, Ackland Museum of Art in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Crocker Museum of Art in Sacramento, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Schnitzer Museum in Oregon, Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and the Hood Museum of Art in New Hampshire. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> yes. So let's, let's go ahead and jump right in and get started with our questions. Mm -hmm. So the first one, I think, is basic in some ways, but also um, in the time we're living in now, and especially considering your work, rather complex. And so that is, what makes something a portrait for you? How do you define portraiture? Okay. Um, well, first, let me just uh, say congratulations on a beautiful show that you curated, Liz, along with Christine Kim. It, it's just so fabulous to see. It's really important and honored to be part of the show and certainly honored to be on this talk. <laughs> yeah. With regard to the question, portraiture to me is really about expressing a theme or an idea via a portrait. It's like a personification of a theme. I always come up with the theme first and then I'm thinking, okay, how do I express this? How do I get this across? And kind of um, coincidentally, I've been doing portraits all this time, like for the past 30 years. So mm -hmm. it seems like a kind of roundabout way, like one might think, oh, maybe a more narrative approach or something would be a better way to, um, to tackle certain subjects. But for me, I kind of go for the emotion. I take into account 
um, all of the elements to try to get the point across or the thoughts across. So that would include materials. Um, you know, I use mixed media materials that already is giving you a sense of history to the, uh, to the person who's in the portrait. Um, I use mixed uh, iconography as far as um, images with uh, the usage of surrealism and symbolism. That's a way for me to ask questions. So um, let's say it's a topic like gender renaissance, which was a show that I did in, um, in 2017. And backing up a bit how I decide on my themes, they're always something very personal, something going on in my life. So with that, that theme of gender renaissance, it was exploring my whole experience of having a trans son who transitioned from um, female to male at a pretty young age. It was an ongoing thing for over six or seven years. And so just him being that young and being so involved in the whole transitioning and the, everything, um, medical procedures, the whole emotional thing, psychiatrists, it just really made me, someone certainly of my generation, question this notion of the gender binary. So. Okay, so that's my idea, gender renaissance. Now, how am I gonna actually do it? And I thought, okay, we'll do portraits and just kind of mix up the whole gender uh, symbolism as far as with masculine and feminine, throw in images of um, nature to kind of allude to what's, what's natural, one's natural true self, and just the image of anything in nature kind of connotates uh, truth to me. Um, so there's there's always that specifically about the topic, you know, like what type of materials, iconography, images, juxtapositions, but then an all going along theme <laughs> throughout everything are these things that are personal too. Um, as far as myself, I'm a um, mixed race. My my mother is Betty Sarr, a well known African American artist. Uh, my mother's black, and my father. Um, a beautiful man who's no longer with us, Richard Sarr, is white. So <clears throat> there will always be that questioning of the notion of race and what is race? Is it how you are perceived by others? Because obviously I'm pretty light skinned, white passing. There's a whole issue around that I can get to later on. Um, or is it how you feel within, you know, your experiences, your heritage, who you are inside? Um, yeah, so there's always that on, ongoing level. And then, and then just everything else that's going on in my life that I kind of incorporate. So there'd be that sort of thought of questioning race. So the portraits are like a spectrum as far as diversity, as far as how they actually look. So um, there's that. And then the, also the mixed race thing that comes into everything else is this notion of European colonization imposed on... Uh, on people of color, on black people. So I will use fabrics. Um, I don't know if they're gonna show one of the images. I will use, yeah, uh, pull it up. yeah let's get this image up. This is a banner, a large tapestry. And mm. um, so this is called, the title of this is Septim, a color, a collector of breezes, hoarder of voices, gatherer of olfactory ephemera, once changed her lover into a lake to protect him. So I've juxtaposed image of a, an African-American or African diaspora woman with fabrics that are very um, colonial European. The whole notion of tapestry is very European. So that's sort, sort of that tension um, going on there between the two cultures. Um, and again, the symbolism with the surrealism uh, of the eggs floating about kind of connotating to, to to birth and what's natural and what's one's true identity, one's true authenticity, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. there is that. And then the, the third way that I would approach uh, portraiture is hopefully um, this notion of being transported or kind of going on a time traveling voyage. Most of my subjects are set in the 19th century, like the Victorian era. It's, you know, an acknowledgement to my ancestors. But then mm -hmm. it's also a way of like, when I'm addressing a certain issue, say um, the gender binary or, or, or race kinds of questions or notions of sanity. These are like issues that have been going on since like forever. It's not a new issue, maybe a contemporary issue right now, but by me setting it in the past, um, it's maybe a little less uh, flat footed. It's a way for me to address it that feels 
um, kind of authentic and adding a bit of a journey to it. Mm. Wow. So it, it sounds like uh, portraiture for you is both about a specific person, which it often is in history, but also about these larger themes. So this person might be timeless or might represent a larger issue or topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they aren't always like um, current events or sort of social issues. Like this series is from my A Conjuring of Conjures show that I recently had at Walter Maciel Gallery in LA. I had it done beginning of 2021. I don't know, time is so convoluted. <laughs> Less, uh, I don't know, a while ago. Um, so this kind of had to do with the notion of uh, creating one's own reality, conjuring one's own reality, and what is reality, and... So I created these characters and I gave them these kinds of powers and attributes and um, put in a lot of research, you know, as far as into hoodoo and voodoo, even Russian um, folk tales and magic oh, wow. and just kind of created these stories for these characters to somehow get across this idea of um, what it actually is what well, kind of questioning reality and, and, and what it is to sort of create your own reality. I'm mm. a very interior person, kind of a hermit. And um, so although this isn't necessarily a social issue, it's something that's personal. It's something that I was thinking about at the time. And um, uh, yeah, so that was something that I explored with that, that show. Great. All right. Let's pull up the next image and I'll, ask you our second question, which is, you know, your work is being shown during a pretty transformative time for art museums, given both the pandemic, but also these ongoing conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion. So what it has, what has it been like to think about your work in this kind of moment? How do you think your work will be or is received now? Um, well, okay, I guess I've always done portraits of people who are outside the norm in one way or another. <laughs> you know, someone who is marginalized or outside of what's considered normal with regards to race, gender, sexuality, sanity, kind of all of those things. Um, and a lot of that is just sort of, again, based on, you know, um, kind of, personal experience. Um, so I'll often do portraits of um, a black person with albinism. That's kind of a metaphor for me. I think I have another image of that coming up later on. Or uh, this, this, uh, this guy here, Asant, who um, has blue eyes, you know, the sort of connotation of, of not quite fitting into, um, within like these sort of arbitrary um, constructs of, what uh, what sort of race is. So I had actually done a show at um, CAM called Salon de Refusé, which was um, Salon of the uh, Rejected or the Refused. And it was based on um, all the artists back in Paris, the Paris Salon that had been rejected. And they were kind of the forward thinking artists, you know, so they did their own salon. It was called Salon de Refusé. So I took that title, but also the Refusé or the Rejected kind of had to do with these actual people who had um, who were diverse, who were different in one way or another, whether it was with regard to race, gender, sexuality, or, or um, you know, neurological normalcy. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, that's been an ongoing thing. And I think um, I can kind of make a correlation to the way you and Christine did this show because it's hung salon style. And it made me think of <laughs> the salon de refusé that was in Paris and all of these artists or all of these portraits, all of these images that have been excluded from museums for all, for all these years and all of the artists who have been excluded and for people to finally come and see representations of themselves, people that look like them in the museum. I mean, it's just such a beautiful thought and I thought that was a great way to, to kind of present it. It's like this is sort of the, um, like just the uh, emphasis of it all is, is combined by feeling like, you know, all these people who, uh, were denied exposure can have it mm -hmm. can have it now so um, yeah so I'm thinking now I mean a lot has changed um, 
since I started doing these types of portraits maybe 30 years ago, there's more uh, in the public consciousness about diversity, certainly with regard to trans or people of color or sexuality and, and all of that. So um, maybe there's, a, maybe not so odd my work now, I don't know, but I always throw in weird things just to keep people guessing and um, kind of the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of the sort of objects kind of make a person go, huh? So if the topic is gender, just right away, someone's going to go, huh? Because it doesn't make any sense. You know, just this notion of getting people to maybe question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in this image, you've got the, what, tortoise and the thread and needle right. and these yeah. symbols. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, this is, is also from my Conjuring of Conjuring series. And um, yeah, so this is about a son who did not like reality. So he built his own dream of the senses fortress, which ultimately was a disappointment. And this explains his love of tragedy. So um, there's kind of the notion of, of conjuring and ritual and various elements that go into that. But then it's also sort of specifically referencing back to this book that I had read that was called uh, Against Nature, Our Bog, written by um, Usman, this French writer. It's like written in the um, late 1800s. And um, it was about this guy that kind of retired from society and, and devoted his uh, studying of all these different things like um, foods and flowers. And there's a scene where he buys a very elaborate rug, but it's too garish. So he gets a boring tortoise to put on it to make the rug not so garish but the rug looks more garish. So he puts a bunch of jewels on the tortoise and then the tortoise dies. Just sort of this weird convoluted exploration of, um, of, uh, of his taste and his beauty and conjuring this very specific kind of reality. Mm -hmm. So again, when I use things like uh, nature, already it's kind of like just saying, um, okay, like what's truth, you know? <laughs> To me, nature is true. And uh, so all these other things as far as identity and um, who you are, who you really are, uh, mm -hmm. I kind of use these things as a metaphor to, to, to sort of add to the portrait to, to say that this is the real, uh, you know, the real person. <laughs> mm, I love that. And then when you look back at the work, from your earlier career? This is the third question. What do you see that's different from what you saw at the time? Looking back in time at your own work, and maybe we can bring up the next image as you talk about that. Right. Yeah, so this is a piece from um, 10 years ago. <clears throat> and it's part of my Mad Woman in the Attic series where I sort of mm -hmm. examine this notion of um, of sanity and how in a lot of Victorian novels, um, there are uh, heroines who have gone insane, but they've actually gained agency by becoming mm -hmm. insane and wrecking habit and that kind of thing. So I picked characters from 19th century literature. This is Taras Rakan, who actually was mixed. Like you wouldn't really know it reading the book written by um, Emile Zola, but like there's some passion, passion just all of a sudden and then her African blood ran through her veins, her heated veins. It's like, oh, okay. Like he didn't really make a big deal that, that her um, mother was black. But anyway, that's like French, like literature, weird. Um, so yeah, so my approach, my, the themes have always kind of been the same of sort of taking people who are outside the, the the norm, uh, the mm. what's considered normal. But back then, I think I took a more complex approach. I kind of had a lot of ideas, like, um, which I kind of like because it's different, but it's just kind of not what I'm doing uh, now. I use photography, mm. like all these circles are little miniature dioramas that I set up and photographed. Mm. So that was quite time consuming. And um, you just more of a more mixed media approach, whereas now I'm more focused on, on painting. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really think that much has changed just because the emphasis has always been on the ideas and the themes and that's what gets me excited. I always mm -hmm. sort of struggle a few months trying to come up with a new idea and um, 
deciding how do I best explore that idea. And this was a way by setting up these little miniatures to explore the narrative of these novels, I mean, not linearly <laughs> or mm -hmm. exactly, but just to kind of get the idea across, across that this was based on some sort of uh, narrative. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, not a whole lot has changed. I've always done painting, you know, Back in the 90s, it was kind of considered corny, I guess, to be a painter. Now everyone was a painter of <laughs> conceptual <laughs> stuff back then. But I, that's just always been what I've done. And another thing that I've always done as far as trying to um, have what feels to me like some type of authenticity is the style of painting, which is I would call colonial. So that's sort of the European colonial imposition on, say, a country like Mexico, like if you look at those Costa paintings, like from the 17 and 1800s, where um, the, the, the painters of the country are sort of painting in the style of the European colonialists, but there's this other stuff going on, there's this kind of tension. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a style that I've done that I think kind of fits with my kind of mixed, you know, heritage thing. Mm. That's great. And I love that these that the, the kind of questions and themes have continued throughout and the media have changed, but even things like these spheres still appear in your work and allow you kind of, like you said, portals into different aspects of a, mm -hmm. of a story or even to a different time. That's mm -hmm. something I think very unique and beautiful about your work in particular. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I do still use the circular thing with collages. And mm. yeah, it's true. They sort of serve as these sort of cellular memories or or dreams or thoughts. or So that is also a way to kind of get into the history of the, like as far as portraiture goes, getting to the history of the subject, you know, even though mm -hmm. this is just a character from literature, just to kind of flesh it out and... Um, yeah, give it a little bit of dimension. <laughs> Great. Let's pull up the fourth picture. And I would love to say to the audience now, if you have questions that you would like to ask Leslie, please feel free to use the chat, the Q&A, and we will try to ad address those at the end of the program. So as we look at this image, I'd love to ask you, what do you envision for the future? of portraiture? What themes or topics or discussions do you think will be prevalent in the future of art by Black artists? Um, okay, well, I mean, I can only <clears throat> sort of speak for myself. I don't know that I necessarily have a vision uh, for the future. And I have to say that um, I don't feel I should say like what the future of um, black artists are because um, I feel in these instances, I'm just sort of a little bit, mm, no, uh, I just wanna be so very careful because my presentation, the way I present is like white passing or light skin or light passing. So I always try to acknowledge my privilege and um, kind of address colorism and address the idea of someone who presents themselves as I do, um, of taking up space and speaking about to a reality or, or making any kind of statements like that. Now I always have to add, yeah, I did not want to look like this my whole life. I've wanted to look more like my mom because nobody ever thought she was my mom. They thought she was mm. my babysitter or nanny. So um, obviously I didn't choose to look like this, but it's not about me. It's not about the tragic mulatto trope or anything like that. It's really about, I think someone that looks like me that, um, is obviously on this platform where we're talking about, a, an exhibition about black portraiture and true. Not every artist in this show is black. You've got like Shepard Fairey and some of those older pieces that, um, I don't know who did them, but, um, you know, but here I am on this platform. Mm you know, this Ofe looking honky. <laughs> People are like, what the hell? Not everybody knows my mom, you know? Of course, my mom was a powerful, strong black woman. That's my heritage, that's who I am inside. But there's also the notion of like, um, would I ever do a show about 
Black Lives Matter. No, I would feel that would be an appropriation because me, the way I'm presented, mm -hmm. I'm never going to be the brunt of police brutality or any kind of systematic racism or colorism, which is just one way. It's not about like how somebody hurt my feelings back in you know college saying I wasn't black enough. That's not colorism. That's just somebody being rude, you know? So um, mm -hmm. I'm always just really careful to say it and never comes off right. People think, oh, you know, you're like, uh, you got some identity complex or you're being self-deprecating. It's just not about me at all. It's just there's certain instances where I just don't feel it's appropriate for me to take up space talk about something like that and so this is actually a pretty um, good example of how I'll use a metaphor of an African-American woman who is at albinism so it's this idea of presenting as a white whiteness outside but being black within um, so this is from my show Black Garden that just recently was in Seoul Korea at various small fires um, so that was really exciting to kind of get my work and see <clears throat> like over in Asia and see how that was re, um, received. It was just really a marvelous experience. And um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I'm not going <laughs> to, yeah. not right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for that, because I think that is a, um, you know, particularity colorism that can often get glossed over in our uh, media and culture today. You know, you have someone who appears like you and I, very fair skinned with, you know, ambiguous features. And those are often the people who are chosen to represent, exactly. mm -hmm. you know, ethnicity. Um, and I mean, we can get into the ways that um, women in particular are exoticized mm -hmm. for their features. And, um, you know, it's something that I think is inherent whenever you're talking about uh, blackness and, and also representation. So I appreciate that. And, um, you know, again, I think you just go so far um, when it comes to realness and representation and um you know like this picture of this albino figure it's it's one of those uh ways of looking ways of seeing ways of being that is really not explored primarily in in visual culture mm -hmm. all right let's go to the last picture and the last question and so this is more something I think you can answer <laughs> from your <laughs> perspective uh, because it's, it's more about your intention as an artist or your hope for your artwork. Mm -hmm. And that is, what do you hope a viewer will take away with them after seeing your work or more specifically this picture in Black American Portraits? Right. Um, well, you know, I'm always kind of going for a certain emotion that at least I'm feeling. Of course, you can never control how the viewer is going to feel. Um, but I have found when I've sort of dealt with these different topics that are maybe specific to my experience, where um, there's a kind of tension, the questioning, uh, this uh, emotion being portrayed of feeling like one doesn't belong or is marginalized or, or an outsider. And people bring to that their own experience and identify with that. So I'm kind of more interested in that, like not somebody getting exactly what I intended with this, mm -hmm. um, but more walking away with their own kind of uh, emotion, some kind of emotion, whatever that would be. So this piece of a bed of night iris shedding petals one by one like the hours of darkness is a, another one from my Black Garden series. And I based it on this a very gothic melancholic poem written by um, Antonin Artaud in the early 1900s. And so, um, you know, I'm one of those persons who likes gothic and I like the 19th century and Victorian that just whole being enveloped in that whole vibe and, and era. So I'm not always about 
the uplifting, although I juxtapose like bright colors and images of, of nature, you've got these, um, these things from the ocean, these corals and, and, and flowers and designs and bones. And once again, just hearkening back to this idea of nature and presenting one's true self and one's true nature or the person in the portrait. And then there's this very sort of um, desolate, dark scene of a foggy uh, burnt trees or silhouetted trees or just kind of delving into, um, you know, um, go into the dark. I'm not afraid to like go to where, where it's dark and dark thoughts and, and, and depression and sadness and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And then once again, it's framed in this very Baroque uh, European colonized type of frame on a very kind of, uh, uh, it's like a fleur de lis or some sort of French fabric that's behind it. So there's kind of this mm -hmm. tension of the portrait of, um, uh, of, a, of, of a black woman w within this colonized connotation but then kind of going dark and personal and um, mysterious and gothic and so this one I really was just sort of going for an emotion and um, even if someone just stares at it and goes huh that's like you know good <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, you know I have to say because I, I went to uh, first we all showed up to do the portrait uh, the, the photograph the group photograph Right. And the next day was like the gala. But then on the third day, when, um, you know, was Naima Keats and, uh, and Cello Montayo, your, your idea to do like a very public family kind of opening. I got so emotional when I walked into that room. I mean, I'd seen this show like two times mm -hmm. already. And just to see like the families with their kids and stuff. And, um, you know, because I always used to be dragged to museums when I was a kid and stuff. And, and um, just for people to see themselves on the wall, I was like, I got a little teary. I thought this is like a brilliant idea mm -hmm. for you guys in the education or whatever public programs department to make it less of an elitist opening, you know. And um, so I got a little bit of a vibe from that. I don't know exactly what everyone was feeling, but that, that felt good. It felt like, okay, people are mm -hmm. getting something out of this that I can appreciate. Yeah. And I really have to echo you on that. I will say, uh, again, Naima Keith and Cello Montoya and the education team really worked hard to make this something different. Right. So, of course, we wanted to change what was on the walls, but also rethink what an opening looks like, what support models look like, because um, museums are about more than just what you see in the exhibitions. And so the process was really um, beautiful. And I want to read something that Meredith Lancaster wrote in the Q&A. And again, and if everyone in the audience, feel free to use the Q&A to ask questions. But Meredith says, not really a question, more of a comment of appreciation for this show and this programming. I cried when I walked through the galleries, seeing myself reflected on the walls through all the beautiful black faces and imagery. It was really remarkable and powerful. Thank you both. And I think what you're saying you experienced on that Sunday, that opening family day that was free to the public is what Meredith is saying. You know, this is a moment in time when we've, we've heard, we know that museums have not lived up to their charges, their missions of representing the people who they serve. And it is no small thing to bring a show to life and also to bring new acquisitions in to the collection that will be there for generations. I should say that we acquired almost, I think it's exactly 60 works on the occasion of this exhibition, including this portrait. So thank you so much for that, Leslie. It's a really um, powerful addition to LACMA's collection. Oh, thank you. <laughs> There's a technical question from Schroeder Cherry to you, and that is, how do you handle the sewing in your work? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I sew everything myself. I guess I'm 
old school that way. Um, I just have a huge table in my studio and um, good sewing machine and combine fabrics that I've gotten at like Joanne's walking around with all the other house frows. And then along with, um, you know, bits and pieces I found at, uh, you know, swap meets and, and flea markets of embroidery and trims, antique trims and, and that kind of thing. So it's just laying it out, pinning it and, and, and sewing them. They are, they're, they're pretty big. They can be from 80, 89 inches to like 60 mm. inches wide. So um, I guess one thing I didn't mention before is I like the tension of me working between scale, like the banners are really, really large. And then these portraits mm -hmm. are quite small and delicate. Like a lot of them, I use really tiny brushes, like 20 over zero or that kind of thing to get the detail of the nature and that kind of thing. And the difficulty of switching back and forth kind of keeps me on my toes, kind of this absolute mm -hmm. beginner sort of feeling of it being a, a challenge and me like kind of being aware and um, tackling and switching back and forth between the very small and, and the large and then an exhi the exhibition. I think it creates kind of a nice tension, just the physicality of the two scales. So mm -hmm. that's um, one of the reasons I like doing the large banners. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. so they're sewn and then I paint the acrylic painting on top of it afterwards. Acrylic. And I love um, hearing you talk about going to Joanne's Fabrics and flea markets. Um, I feel like that's uh, evidence that you really are Betty Starr's daughter. Because yeah, <laughs> all of us, Allison, it's like, uh, we're yeah. always looking on the ground, trying to find something to. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Bring objects into new light. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Lorna Grenadier. Uh, says, it's interesting that you use frames as part of your artwork. Um, the National Portrait Gallery has a full-length portrait of Denise Graves, and the gold frame names includes names of pieces she has sung, but it's rare to see that. Also, to note that Michelle's portrait has no frame. It actually does have a frame. It's just a very thin, simple white frame. I'll, I'll say that, but... Um, yeah, maybe you could talk about this frame and the way you use frames in your work. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I've thought about this before, like, oh, should I be more contemporary and not use frames? And I have done some series. I did a, a series of portraits of rap artists called Rap Thugs and Dimes back in like 2004. And um, mm -hmm. they didn't have frames, but they were like these large panels and uh, it was mixed media. I like nailed these old album covers kind of depicting like these sort of uh, lifestyles of the 50s and 60s and then juxtaposing that with images of actual rappers like um, I don't know Gangsta Boo and Lil' Kim and I did portraits like a um, Tupac. So um, yeah I like using the frames because uh, this continual theme I have of my mixed heritage and a nod to uh, being black and also being white. So like the frame is symbolic, this Rococo Baroque frame is kind of symbol, symbolic of, a, of European colonialism and juxtaposing that with the portrait. Well, not all my portraits are um, of people who are black, but it's just sort of that kind of creates sort of disparity as a little bit of a um, questioning there. It's a nod to that, to my mixed heritage. And then it's also kind of kitsch. So I try to keep things not too, um, serious you know uh throwing things in there a little strange or weird or or corny or kitsch is kind of part of my drip mm. <laughs> i love that um before i ask this next question from vivian lynn um to orient people if you have an opportunity or have already been to see the exhibition black american portraits which is on view through April 17th of next year. This work sits on a wall that we kind of call the contemporary looking back at history. It's a wall with uh, a work by the artist Titus Kafar. There's a, a large scale photograph by Renee Cox and all of the objects on that wall 
have been made within the last um, six years or so. And we, as the curators thought, looked back at history. And so Vivian asks, you reference different histories and literature in your work. Is researching histories part of your art process? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really big part of it. Um, mm. You know, not just sort of the collection of, of, of images with regard to um, the times and, and the aesthetics of it and everything, but just stories about people that I can find, um, <clears throat> literature, like I read a lot of um, kind of 19th century literature and that kind of thing. And um, again, sort of this idea of, uh, I like to take a contemporary topic and set it in the past to sort of connotate like, well, this isn't really anything new. I mean, there were trans people a hundred years ago. <laughs> we're just, uh, it's just kind of like a, something that we're more conscious of now in the, in the, in the public consciousness. So uh, yeah, I do a lot, a lot, a lot of research um, and uh, kind of my approach is sort of mixed media as far as like how I, plan things it's almost a collage approach I also do collages but just taking a really long time to, not only do they take me forever to paint I just take a really long time to decide like if it's any good I'm not um fast so uh there's a lot of research I'm interested in that kind of thing there's a lot of thinking about the piece before I start executing it and, um that's a big part of the process yeah mm -hmm. Jerry Boyles asks do you ever make portraits from actual photographs of your subjects? Yes, what I will do is I have to say I'm not um, trained. I did not go to art school. I took like maybe one art school, one art class in high school. Um, but I majored in radio TV film and I was interested in working mm -hmm. at the radio station and everything when I was up in the Bay Area. So mm -hmm. I'm not trained as an artist. I um, you know, I always do everything ass backward. I don't really know how to do it. And I guess it's irritating because both of my parents are artists, but it's not like they said, here, Leslie, this is how you draw. I just, I always was drawing and painting, but never like really properly trained. So I will work from a photograph, but it like never looks like the person. So, um, and they're always uh, in the public domain because they're like a hundred years old, you know, or I'll, I'll take, I'll combine, like I put a head, on some dress that I like or some position of a, mm -hmm. of a person. I always work from photographs. Or I've started taking photos um, so I can get people to pose in certain ways, like, you know, I'm kind of late to the party for that. But uh, for me, I have to visually see something. I don't just do it out of my head. I feel if I were just to do everything out of my head, they would all look alike. So I need a visual reference and um, mm -hmm. they're, they're collage. They're from real old photos and, since I'm not very good at rendering, it ends up looking like a completely different person. So that's cool. Mm. And Elizabeth Sussman wants to know, you have images from nature as part of your portraits, trees, strange organisms. Is there meaning to what you choose or just visual attraction? Uh, well, it's both. It's um, first I start with the visual attraction, uh, the aesthetics, and then I look at it for a while. And I'm like, oh, no, this is going to have a connotation that I don't want to say, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes you putting things together and, and it's saying something that you didn't intend, you know, mm -hmm. but it's usually for me to sort of juxtapose like uh, this notion of juxtaposition, whether it's with uh, intent, like nature, um, this idea that I have of um, beauty and all these other value judgments, these arbitrary um, kind of constructs and value judgments that we have about beauty, uh, sexuality, gender, all of these things that are sort of, um, uh, you know, constructed versus nature that's just natural and growing. So I'll mm -hmm. often just for my own little um, symbolism, <laughs> juxtapose that, throw that into the theme to say like, well, what is or isn't natural? You know, um, I have a trans son that's, that's totally natural. It makes perfect sense to me. You know, these kinds of things that are so 
so that were so questioned. Um, if you if you juxtapose it with this image of nature, it's like I'm saying this is real, this is natural, this is true. Hmm. Oh, I love that. Um, someone says or wants to know, noticing how you build upon traditional portrait elements and deconstruct them in innovative ways. They all seem to be part of a multiverse. Do you see your works all connected, even if they are part of different series or themes? Yeah, um, that, that's a good question because um, when I had the show at CAM, the California African American Museum, um, I was trying to come up, well, how do I unify? I had things from four different series. How do I unify it to, to, to make it feel like it all goes together instead of like, oh, this is just some sort of chronological <laughs> presentation of the work because I do come up with these really specific different themes and so there is an overlying theme of um, of people who have kind of been excluded for one reason or another marginalized you feel like they don't belong you feel different who are anomalies whether it's regard to physically how they look or um, mentally neurologically with regard to sanity with regard to race, um, you're talking about ambiguity within within race, um, mm. gender, sexuality, all of those things. So, mm. um, and even if it's a more ethereal type of topic, just kind of being in my own interior world, there's always just sort of this outside kind of element to it that connects all of the themes together, I think. Uh, mm. So, um, that was what I kind of came up with, this Salon de Refusé for the show at CAM that was uh, a way to tie them all together. The outcasts, the outsiders, mm -hmm. the uncategorizable. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, someone wants to know if portraiture is about identity and if one's identity can change over time, would you ever consider making a portrait of the same person at different ages? Oh, that's interesting. Um, hmm. Well, I haven't really done that. I did do a portrait of, uh, of my uh, child <clears throat> who is neurologically atypical. They were diagnosed with autism at the age of two. So they were maybe four years old and I kind of... Um, age progressed them to where maybe in the painting they look like they're 10 or something like that and I'd actually um I don't know if this is answering my question I actually put a zipper on their mouth and it turned out that mm. um they developed elective mutism for for a long period of time and right now they're back on the thing of not wanting to of not speaking like for years so mm. it was almost this sort of um foreshadowing this premonition oh. um so yeah, I don't know. I I, um, I don't know if I uh, mm. yeah. I I would I would consider that. I've done portraits of real people. Most of them are from a while ago. Like I did one of James Baldwin or um, all of those rappers that I did, like Tupac and um, Bone Thugs and Harmony, and all my favorite gangster rappers that I like. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah, I, I hadn't really thought of that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Then and, what, then and now <laughs> yeah and I think that your story about the portrait of your child and um the ways you said it kind of foreshadowed who they would become is really um powerful the premonition of the portrait yeah out of curiosity you know I know you say you've studied um all of these different kind of uh, spiritual traditions. And I'm curious if there are any other moments um, like that in your work or perhaps um, uh, special, um, even magical coincidences. Hmm. Um whole lot of coincidences I did do a series called monad because I'd kind of I've been in this group where we study esoteric knowledge like the ancient Tibetan Buddhist 
teachings and such. And so the show was called Monad and it was based on the, uh, the concept of as above, so below. And um, so I really kind of delved into that. Nothing you know, part paranormal came out out of doing it or anything, but I kind of got deep into like, okay, this is my idea, monad, as above, so below, and try to figure out like, how do I, uh, how do I present this? So it's just sort of flipped the scale, like thinking of the, the notion of as above, so below has to do with from like um, the minutest tiny cell within your body is, mm. a, is a functioning system just as is your 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 own body to uh, society to the earth to the solar system to the universe like as above from the universe to to down below the minutest cell so i did these people kind of floating through the universe on these cellular mm -hmm. spaceships um kind of flipping the scale to where the minutest thing being the human cell was this actual vehicle that they're floating on and 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 the humans are um larger than the little planets and other things that are within the these sort of universal uh, esoteric paintings that I had done. But no, not a whole lot of, um, you know, paranormal, uh, <laughs> nothing else to report that's out of the ordinary. <laughs> yeah. I'll take this as the last question. I think it's a good segue. What will you make next? Oh gosh, um, yeah. Well, I just finished the uh, the Black Garden one that was sort of poetic and gothic and everything like that. Um, you know, I find myself actually thinking about colorism a lot, and uh, my privilege and the part that I play in that. And uh, but I don't know how I would address that you know I mean that's kind of one that I'd start thinking about and maybe take me a while to figure out like how does one how does one really talk about that you know and um, <clears throat> how does one kind of get that across visually conceptually mm. I think uh, I think it's a real problem and I would recommend anyone who want I'm not a critical thinker anyone who wants to hear someone articulate about it would be Mandy Harris Williams, she's ideal black female on Instagram. Mm. You know, um, I don't know. There's like this meme. I don't know if anybody saw it. You know those memes where people are on a these two guys are on a bus and there's a sad guy on the left and the other guy on the right. And so the sad guy is like um has to show a picture of their grandmother to prove that they're black. And the other guy like is is visibly black or something. And I'm like, ouch, but that's funny. You know, I mean, like, so you kind of have to get over your own little sensitivity and that's not funny uh, and kind of really address it. And, and I'm getting off on the tangent again, but that's, so that's what I'm thinking about. Maybe something like that. Mm. I love that question. And I, I, I think if anyone can figure out how to parse these issues visually it is you so we hope to see that thank you so much leslie for your work and for joining us today and for the thoughtful discussion you've left us with i think many of us will be thinking about things you brought up for days to come and thank oh, you thank you liz <laughs> yeah and um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you to Naima and Cello and the entire education team at LACMA. And we're so happy that people are joining us for all these wonderful programs around the Black American Portraits exhibition at LACMA. Have a wonderful day.